Hey everyone, it's Kimber from the Backyard Horse Enthusiast. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with an inspiring young lady from upstate New York who's been passionately involved with horses since the tender age of three. Her journey began when her father gifted her a very young horse that sparked a lifelong love for these magnificent animals. Since then, she has not only qualified for the National Barrel Racing World Championships twice on an off-the-track thoroughbred, but she's also become a dedicated ambassador for the thoroughbred racing community. Morgan is a graduate of the esteemed Casanova College. She earned her BPS degree in management with a specialization in equine business management, along with a minor in business and an equine reproduction certificate. Since graduating in May, 2023, she has stepped into the professional world working at the Finger Lakes Gaming and Racetrack in the Test Barn, following a valuable internship at the only thoroughbred nonprofit adoption center located on a racetrack in the U.S. In addition to her roles in racing and rehabilitation, she is making her mark as the head trainer at Velvet Lane Stables, where she shares her expertise with aspiring riders. With a wealth of experience and a deep commitment to the equine industry, she has much more to share. Join us as we dive into her remarkable journey and explore her insights into the world of horses and racing. Morgan, welcome to an episode of the Backyard Horse Enthusiast. We are so pleased to have you here to enlighten our viewers as to the work that you have done, that you are doing, and where you embark in life going forward on this journey. Thanks awesome. for, for having me. You're very welcome. Wonderful. Well, we're going to dive right in, Morgan, because I've got quite a few questions I'd like to ask specific to your background. The one thing that I am aware of, well, many things here, but what struck me was the age you began riding. I think you were three years old and your dad bought you your first horse. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. So this happens. Tell us about that first horse and how that sparked your passion for everything equine. Absolutely. So actually... It was my first horse at the age of three, um, and it, he's a registered paint, to which I actually still have to this day. He's going to be turning 20, I believe, if I'm doing my math correctly, he's turning 20, but he was a six-month-old colt that my dad got me at three years old, which is like, <laughs> as I'm older, it's like, that is your worst nightmare, <laughs> um, child with a, with a colt at six months, but yeah, we actually ended up being able to grow up together and hit all of the milestones together. And now he's happily living his little semi retirement life. So he definitely, I, I just jumped right in with that. We had, owning a horse, going out there times a week um, and doing all things. So he just sparked everything, everything in me, honestly. <sighs> There's not, there's not one time. Well, he did break my arm when I was five. So learning experience, it, it happens. It's part of, it's part of the whole thing. So there was that. Sure. Oh my gosh. I mean, how wonderful that you had a father that was willing to, to take the plunge with you. Was he an equine enthusiast? Who, who where, where did this come from? Yeah. So it's, it's honestly a really funny story. My dad was not a, a horse enthusiast. Actually, no one in my family has, I could go as far as to say probably ever ridden a horse until I came along. And then it became a part of family, uh, 
vacations and oh we have to go ride the horses on the beaches of the Bahamas and all of that stuff but no my father at the time was not involved with horses he had actually um my parents were divorced so he started dating a woman who owned her own horse farm and then it became something that we all did together when I was with him and we just gradually like started doing more and more and like I was very young and it was I want to go see the horses. And he was fine with that because let's go see the girlfriend. And um, <laughs> it kind of developed into that was our bonding time. I did horses with my father. And then in the past or in the uh, the time I was with my mother, I did. I excelled at softball and I was a softball pitcher. So I had my own hobbies on either side of the, the parent spectrum there. And um, he started riding with us. So then, you know, we had the barn owner and his girlfriend and we would go on trail rides and I got to have so much more experiences than just having that one horse. She had a, she had a farm of 20 plus horses. So it was an array of any type of breed and discipline. And it was, it was honestly an incredible experience. And if it didn't go that way, I probably wouldn't be here today doing what I, yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, (laughs) And, and, and you then delved into barrel racing and yep. qualified for the National Barrel Racing World Championships twice on an off the track thoroughbred. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> how old were you and what challenges did you face when you were transitioning an off the track thoroughbred into barrel racing? How, and how did you overcome those challenges? So, yeah, let me, let me tell you, it is, it has since become, I would say, I would dare to say my specialty, but um, it's no easy task off the track thoroughbreds. Oh, sorry, the cat is under. Oh, bring them all in. We love <laughs> animals. We have um, dogs, cats, horses. It's fine. Have, <laughs> uh, however, uh, it, it is quite the challenge transitioning and off the track thoroughbred. He, at the time, I believe he was a 12-year-old. Um, his name was John the Jeweler, registered name, came from the local thoroughbred racetrack that we have to me. And um, actually, my farm at one point did take in 23 off the track thoroughbreds at the end of November before the meet ended. And so they just loaded it up, loaded them up for free and sent them to us. So our farm, uh, our my previous farm was actually called Life After Racing because we had retrained those 23 thoroughbreds and I think we kept two or three and all of the rest were rehomed and found show jumper homes, barrel racing, just kid lesson horses. It was honestly amazing. And that's what shaped me to realize like these horses can go on to do anything besides racing. So then they have the speed. It's more of the turning aspect that you really have to work on them with because they just know running and running very fast So I had to do a lot of honestly slow work with him and learning to teach him to uh, collect up and not just, you know, be full out flat galloping around a barrel because that just doesn't work out. So um, doing that at a young age, I was about I was a junior and a senior in high school. So about 17, 18 Um, and two years back to back, I qualified to go to Perry, Georgia, which is where the world show is. I did not end up going just because at the time I was a high school student, COVID was just going to be starting up. Not that we knew that, but finances and everything else, I was just honored to have even qualified for that. So that was something uh, I thought was extremely awesome. Who are your, um, idols in barrel racing? Cause one comes to mind for me and that's Fallon Taylor, of course, oh. right? <laughs> Yes. I follow her. <laughs> I follow her. I watch all of her YouTube videos. Um, Phelan has been a huge inspiration of mine. I think that she is honestly, she is an idol to look up to in the sport. I think that she is very, I think she's very well spoken. She does the sport a lot of justice. Mm-hmm. And so I love Phelan Taylor. I also love Haley Kenzel. Um, she's won the uh, NFR, I think two times now. Um, I think she's absolutely amazing. I love her Palomino. I'm partial to Palominos. Have I ever had one? No. Do I, I think have. Oh, well, I, you. I do think it's beautiful. Unfortunately, I know better than to buy off of color, but I do love <laughs> Palomino. So those are my two inspirations. And I think, I think they're really good people to look up to. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And speaking of thoroughbred advocacy, you are a huge ambassador for racing thoroughbreds. Absolutely. What message 
would you like to convey about the potential of off the track thoroughbreds in other disciplines? Um, I can't speak highly enough about them. I think they can l literally do anything and everything. Um, I've seen them go from, you know, like scrawny, very, I call it their rat stage. They go from off the track where they're extremely muscled and they look gorgeous and they're worked perfectly. And then they come to reality where it's okay. You maybe get rid in two, three times a week when they have a letdown period, you know, ho hopefully for six months they can, you know, it's more of a mentally let down from everything going on at the racetrack. And then they go through what I call the rat stage where they are looking a little thin and they're losing muscle, but they're not skinny because they they're gaining fat because they're coming back to not a racetrack seven day a week galloping life so um once they get through then that that stage that little letdown period and they build up you know normal metabolism they they can do honestly anything i've i've done cross country i mean barrel racing gaming shows currently at my barn uh, where i give lessons to we have seven off the track thoroughbreds giving lessons to six and up at walk trot and they are totally content doing it. They love their job. Walk trot. Don't ask them anything else and they are fine with it. They don't need to run. They don't need to be hot and let off steam. I, that for me has just been a huge eye opener, excuse me, eye opener because a lot of people think that they're just so hot headed and they need to run and they need to like, just be out of control. And that's so far from the truth. I found that if you give them a job and they, they will tell you if they like it, if not, I've explored other options. Like I tried one time with a mare barrel racing. She said, not for me. I said, okay, jumping. She was like, yes, you found it. And I was like, okay. So, I mean, it's listening to the horse and they'll, they'll show you what they're interested in, is as well, because I mean, they are the ones doing it. They should have a little bit of a say. And yeah, I just, there's no limitations to them. I mean, given if they have injuries, then you have to reevaluate with a vet. But I found that they can go, they can go anywhere. Oh, I love it. I love it. So you were educated at, I probably will not pronounce this correctly, Casanova College? Yes. Am I close? Yo, you got it, Casanova. And that had to have been quite specialized, your education. And you received a degree in equine business management with your focus on equine reproduction, how did that shape the career path you are on right now, that education, that degree? Oh gosh, <laughs> that I would, argue, I would have to say it was the best time of my life. I, I'm, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I'm extremely intelligent, but it has to be tuned to a certain degree of, I like hands-on. I love to be outdoors. I am not an inside office worker. So when I was looking for college, I was looking at, I was looking at um, Morrisville. I'm not sure if you're familiar. That's a huge equine college in New York state. And I was looking at Cobal school, anything hands-on. I was even looking in the dairy industry, something animals. It's gotta be animals. So um, I was looking around and I found this college and it was, it was perfect because it was, it was management. So I can, I have a business degree, so I can go be an accountant. I can go manage a construction site. I can, I can do so many things, but I specialize in the equine. So it made my family feel a little bit better that they're like, oh my gosh, you're not just learning about horses. I'm still getting a business degree. So if anything does fail, you have a fallback plan to go work at any business, any bank, any financial institution. And so that made them feel a little bit better, but yes, then I, um, I was able to um, get my reproduction certificate, which I absolutely loved. I I found it was my little my little niche niche. It was it was there for me. Um, I had an amazing mentor and professor at the time who was able to acquire a one point three million dollar racehorse stallion for our school to so, to work with, um, and that was an experience in itself. And we we uh, used the Phantom and we bred him every Wednesday. And then we, we did semen evaluations and that was something I had never done before. And he was like, I, he's, he worked at sequel in New York state. So he was like, you have, you have the touch for that. Like that is something, if you wanted to go just do reproduction like that in itself 
would be an awesome thing for you to do. So anything hands-on, the college was absolutely amazing. I was there for three years to earn my bachelor's degree. And thank gosh for that because they ended up shutting down due to financial issues. So unfortunately, the college is no longer there, but I saw all of their clothes, my equestrian equipment. um, And it was just, it was awesome. I have nothing but good things to say. And I've got plenty more to say about that too. Love it. And right now, presently, you are working at Finger Lakes Gaming and Racetrack. So tell us a little more about what your role is in this in a test barn at the racetrack and what insights you've gained about the racing industry based on your experience. Yeah. So I'm going to be honest. I don't know as to how much I can share without breaking confidentiality, sure. but I will be very, I'll be as transparent as possible. Um, I am going to, I'm going to refer to my computer here because it is, we have a very listed thing to say, but it is, I work for the horse racing integrity and welfare unit, which is called high woo for shortened. Um, they are committed and we are committed to enforcing a centralized testing program for horse racing and integrity and safety authority, which is called HISA. And that is governed at a federal level. Um, it is an anti-doping and medication control or ADMC program to ensure uniformity across American thoroughbred racing jurisdictions HISA governs. So it is a mouth, a mouthful. Um, but essentially my job is I am a certified sample collector and the assistant supervisor in my testing barn. And we, I oversee and I help, um, obtain samples, urine, hair, and urine, blood, and sometimes hair samples that will, um, be used to have drug testing done on them to make sure that the horses are safe. Um, that is, a uh, even playing field for all involved in the sport, including betters. Um, and I have learned, I've learned, I learned a lot. It was an awesome out of college job. It was like, boom, I'm right in the equine industry. I'm protecting the horses from possibly harmful chemicals and drugs that they may be taking and racing on as well as I've, I've played softball my whole life. So I'm like even playing field fair game. Absolutely. I love it. And in the horse world, this is great. It was, it was honestly a dream job that I was able to get through my internship. And I learned so much about myself and so much about how to be, how to be a leader as the assistant supervisor amongst um, older individuals with my young age. That was, that was um, a learning curve that I had to, I had to take and learn to grow with. And then from there, it was just interacting with trainers, owners, um, and grooms that take care of these thoroughbreds day in and day out and learning, honestly, a lot more about for thoroughbred racing than I had previously known because I'd known retired thoroughbreds my whole life. But being on the racetrack and seeing these horses amped up in like in a whole different light than what I had seen was also very incredible. Thank you. Yeah. You also interned at the only thoroughbred nonprofit adoption center located on a racetrack in the U.S. Yes. How did that particular experience influence your perspective on racehorse aftercare? Racehorse aftercare. Yeah, that also, again, that was how I got my job, what I'm doing currently. But I did that back in 22 through my uh, my college. And um, I was able to... I was able to do all the managerial stuff. I set up fundraisers. I um, called the references for people who were interested in adopting. And we followed up with these people. We, we talked to vets, we talked to farriers. Um, And having that role made me realize the importance of the aftercare because it is important where they land. It is important that they have a soft Mm -hmm. landing and people hope our goal was to get people who had thoroughbred, um, off the track thoroughbred experience prior because they are a little bit of a different beast i'd like to say um they have different needs than you know your quarter horse or you know your stock horse breeds who are typically a little bit less energy and stuff like that and less maintenance because thoroughbreds typically need more maintenance coming off the track and stuff like that so learning their needs and i wasn't opposed to anyone that didn't have the experience as long as they were willing to hear me out and maybe take some notes on like we found that this amount of grain works better than you know 
your 20 year old fat quarter horse sitting in a field on grass. Cause that doesn't work the best for thoroughbreds sometimes. So learning how to navigate that, that was a huge part in learning my, my aftercare. I had already had, you know, prior experience. I was, I was very fortunate enough to have boarded predominantly my whole life. So I was a little privileged in the fact that you know, my boarding facility took care of a lot of those things. And I just showed up and my horse was beautiful and fat and happy. But being there, you know, that was my responsibility. And then I had to learn how to take on that as well. So that was a that was a great learning experience for me. Nice. Do you think that oftentimes there are people with the best intentions, but not a lot of experience with horses in general that are like, I'm going to go save an off thoroughbred and then get in over their heads as Absolutely. far as yeah. okay yes yes I've, I've seen it many times and I can never be mad at them because intentions mean everything and yeah. if their if their intentions are to save this horse and to help this horse and do x y and z like I'm all for it and I will help you get to where you need to be but I found that it was with and this might be I'm sure it is like horse horses in general, but older, older individuals having expectations, but then obtaining this three-year-old off the track thoroughbred that only been off for maybe a week. And they're like, I'm going to go ride it on trails and it's not going to spook at anything. And it's like, maybe not, maybe not what's not what is going to happen. Let's find you. We also sometimes acquire broodmares that were on the were being broodmares for years and then they were up for sale and maybe not in such a good situation. And that adoption facility will take them back as long as they have raced at that racetrack in the past. So you can see all of that on Equibase. And so if boom, we see, you know, a Finger Lakes horse sitting on some website, who knows where it's going to land. We will take those horses right back. So we do have 14, 15, 16 year old horses that have been around the block that have lost, you know, all that three year old, four year old energy that we have to offer given, you know, certain times of the year, if we have them standing in the stall, I mean, come on out and check them out. It's open to the public 24 seven. And we try to find the best matches, but yes, absolutely. Sometimes intentions are much, much different than the actual, actual situation that's going on. Right. You know, the, it, that scenario sparked me to actually create, and it's a very short guideline book about just, you know, you're, before you buy that horse, here are the things you need to think about. It's a very short book that I did. It's probably, it's less than 70 pages, but it covers everything that when you fall in love with the idea of having a horse for the first time, you haven't thought all these things through. So I'm talking about where, what facility, is it going to be in your backyard? Have you checked into zoning? Do you know what uh, mm. nutrition is? Do you, you know, like, that's awesome. That is so needed. And I, I'm glad you've done that because it's definitely needed. And I, even some of my lesson students, their, their moms are like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get them a horse. And it's like, where's the horse going? Do you have land? Do you, have you talked to your zoning officer? Do you know if manure can be disposed in that area? You know, things that you don't think about until it's like, Whoa, we might've jumped in a little bit over our heads, you know, and a lot of people do. And, and then you end up with a horse that you're trying to unload somewhere because yeah. you just can't provide properly. I mean, even I'm going to go back three decades ago when we were faxing information to people and I had seen the editor of, it was either horse and rider or performance horse. She was an AQHA world competitor, blah, 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 blah. But always her entire life boarded horses at a boarding facility at a show barn and then mm -hmm. she and her husband purchased this beautiful you know like 40 acre ranch blah, well but it wasn't set up yet she didn't know the first thing and mm -hmm. admitted it in her editorial i don't know the first thing about what's involved in bringing our show horses home blah 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 and i sent her like a 10 page fax because i had been you know, I started as a four-year-old with my father owning a very large facility, boarding facility, showing and all that. And I was like, but then I transitioned into having my horses in my backyard. 
and I'm a stats person and data. Like I love to look at. And so I was like, well, here's how many pounds of grain, you'll, you know, based on whatever. And hey, and here, I mean, I went through it all. And she ended up calling me <laughs> to ask if I could sign off my rights or whatever to to allow them to publish my findings on that now here's you know again this is someone who's been showing the world and the congress and all of that but didn't have access to information to how to you know what you need to do to bring your horses home so yes we need to we just need to educate people you know and yeah. ask all the pertinent questions. We don't want these horses to end up in the slaughter pipeline because there were, you had a vision and your horse didn't meet that vision. And now the horse suffers because of it. Like that can't happen. So that's what sparked me to create this, this guide for people. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, here we go. I'm back on to my, all right, now we're going to talk about your doing training at Velvet Lane Stables. Now, are you still a head trainer there? Yes. And what philosophy do you bring to teaching lessons? And how do you incorporate your experience with these off-the-track thoroughbreds into your training methods today? Oh, big one. So <laughs> uh, maybe a unique perspective, but a big thing that I tell my students now, minder, my students are... I would say seven to 12, 13. And then I have some outliers. I, I had an, an older gentleman. He was like 68 and he watched Yellowstone and he wanted to learn how to ride. So I do have some outliers, oh. but predominantly I have, you know, younger students. And my big, my big push as a trainer is I tell them that this is a privilege. Riding horses is a huge privilege and often is taken for granted. And the fact that their mothers and fathers, whoever bring them, grandparents, um, they, they need to know that these horses, they're not toys, they're not disposable and, um, don't take them for granted. Cause I, I was having, I'm sure a lot of trainers have seen, I was having attitudes and maybe not taking the lesson for what it should have been taken. And I just very, I plainly said, I said, how many, how many people do you go to school with that take writing lessons? And it was one, maybe two, sometimes none, depending on what school district they went to. And I said, then that is, that is a privilege. And it's an honor that your parents come here every week, bring you every week. They pay money every week for you to ride. And it's important to learn like just as much as you love interacting with these horses, these horses look forward to interacting with you. Um, even as off the track thoroughbreds and it was important for them to learn that. And that was one of my huge training philosophies when I first started was I was seeing that I remember when I was younger, it was, Oh my God, every day going to the barn was like a dream come true. I, it was every time, it doesn't matter if it was 12 hours later, it was awesome. And I was just like the smell of the barn walking in, you know, the dew. Oh, I could go on. I could literally just envision it. And I wasn't, they wasn't seeing it in these kids. And I was like, I don't know if it's a generational thing or what it is, but why don't they love it as much as I love it? And oh, I was just getting really passionate. So I told them, I was like, please take this as a privilege. Like, this is an honor to have you guys here. And I want you to feel the same way. So that was, it has nothing to do with training. But it was a huge thing for me to be able to demonstrate to them um, and show them my passion. And I want they don't have to necessarily have it at the level that I have it. But just to have a little bit was important for me for them to for them to have that. So that was one of my philosophies, as well as basic horse care and riding ability. I think oftentimes that is overlooked and it's just like we're on a set goal schedule and it. Da, da, da. And if your child doesn't meet this quota, then, you know, they're going to have to get booted down to maybe a lower level of riding. And it's like, I am, I'm not the biggest proponent of that. I think everyone gets equal opportunity and I think grow with the child. Everyone has different learning needs and speeds and abilities. And, um, we are very in inclusive at the barn at, like, I will come back down to your level. I do, I do group lessons. And even if you are in a group, I will work with you five minutes on the side real quick. Just if you need that extra explanation, let me know. And I'm very, very open communication. I like to say our barn is very low key at Velvet Lane Stables because we want everyone to just, Hey Morgan, I got a question. Absolutely. Like I'm, I'm super flexible in that manner. Um, and then as for the off the track thoroughbreds, how I've worked them into the program is 
after my connection at the Finger Lakes Thoroughbred Adoption Program, I like to call her. She's like, I guess my little drug dealer. I was like, you just keep giving me all of these horses, um, you know, and it'd be like, buy one, get one free and take this one home. He's got a broken knee. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh my. We have we have one who's got two chips in the knee and he's um, the vet. After speaking to the vet, she was like, give him six months off and it's going to it's going to scar tissue up and he will have no limitations after looking at x-rays and everything. And I was like, that is awesome to hear. So we've got everything. We are very inclusive. But as for our riding horses, um, they love it. I have we have two brood mares. So they were they were brood mares. One had three foals, one had four foals. And now she's on to her third career after racing in being a mom, she's now doing lessons. And I found that those horses love it the most. They just love the children. They could be mauled by love. <laughs> they are never too much for the children. I love it. So it was not hard to include them into my lessons at all. We have a few geldings that are from the racetrack and they are also older and it's not even just older. We have two seven-year-old mares that are off the track that they're a little bit spicier than the rest of them, but nothing that the children cannot handle. And it's, it's honestly been easy. It's been easy because I, I know what to look for and I know the horse's limitations and what they're not comfortable with. And I just make sure to mitigate, mitigate that between the students and it works out perfect. Are you currently like juggling all these different things at the same, you are, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I knew that was going to be one of your questions. Yes. So I'm, I'm a busy bee. So I do the race, the race, the drug testing in the testing barn Monday through Wednesday. And then I give lessons Thursdays and Saturdays. And I also have a part-time job at a retail store and I do Rover. So I do dog sitting, dog walking, all of that as well. So I am working really hard, but there's a main goal and there's a goal at the end of the line and Fair. it's planned to go to Cornell for farrier school. So I'm saving up for that and I will hopefully be a future chi or future chiropractor. No, my boyfriend is actually going to be doing that. He's in chiropractor school and he's going to do horse chiropractic. However, I'm doing the horse farrier part of it. Oh my gosh, Morgan. Now I understand why you were in the top 10 in reaching out, getting all your stuff to me, the, the, the pre-recording things that we needed. Like, I get it. You, you are amazing. I am like, I'm always so going impressed. to hour. I hope I'm honestly not talking too fast because there's just not at all. Me 24 seven. I'm just, I no. Love it. <laughs> I'm, I'm so grateful that your dad bought you a, a horse at a, a six month old at three <laughs> years of age. I'm, I really am because now you're here. I love this. I love this. So this is where I was going. You are balancing multiple roles in Multiple. Wearing many, many, many hats, mm -hmm. but how, how do you, how do you juggle all these roles without getting burned out? And what is the motivator for you? How do I do it? I have always been extremely good at time management. I am very type A time management is my live and die. Um, I just make sure to schedule myself. I have an agenda, which is so funny because in high school, I used to be like, this is so stupid, like an agenda. But now that thing is my savior and I have everything written down. And I know, you know, I got to set up the farrier, which I do have to do that probably later later today. I got to set up the farrier for the 10 horses and um, I'm going to go to work. And luckily it's not hard to be a sample collector and collect urine. So that doesn't take up too much time. I'm just there. So I have, I have a little free time to do it there. So just finding little cracks in your day that you can get, you know, some things marked off the list. And how do I do it without getting burnt out? Well, I'm still working on that a little bit, but I, it's a work in progress. Um, going to the barn, it, it's just always so healing for me. Um, just even if it's not even to ride, just have quiet time. I'm a big proponent of the radio, but sometimes I just go in the barn and I turn off the radio and I just sit in silence maybe for like five minutes and I'll pet my horse, even though sometimes she's the death of me, but I pet her. She's so challenging. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is why I do it. This is why I pay for you every month. You know, it's all going to be worth it in the end. My end motivator, like I was just briefly saying is I um, already sent in my application to go to Cornell University and hopefully become a part of the farrier um program that they have there for 16 weeks and then I would be certified as a farrier 
and which is a huge need in my, uh, my area. And that is a really big end motivator. I mentioned my boyfriend, he's almost done with chiropractor school for humans, but then he would have to go and get his animal portion of that as well, which is another two years. That's a long time, but he's almost done with grad school. So we've made it this far. We've been together a while, so I've got high hopes. Um, and then we were talking about possibly doing a joint business. So that is like the really far goal. Like I'm talking maybe seven to 10 years down the road, but I would think it as someone who is as busy as me, if I could schedule a horse Cairo and a horse barrier in one appointment and not have to take two days off of work to get that appointment, it's two birds with one stone. I haven't heard anything like it. Um, oh, so in I my, love it. <laughs> that, I think in my area, that'd be so awesome. Like get two, you know, horse people, horse professionals out to get two services done in one portion and it's you know the same business and uh i think that is that is my end goal Ooh, and and align yourself with a a dentist too because right? i i had my vet that would dr wilkinson from tufts she would come out to do all my horse's teeth, but she, as she was their chiropractor as well mm -hmm. in Connecticut, you have to be a vet to do, to practice yes. chiropractic medicine. And, you know, she, she couldn't, she actually wouldn't do them on the same day. Obviously they're, they're, well, she wouldn't do a chiropractic adjustment and then do their teeth. Cause that would throw them out of alignment too. You know what I mean? But yeah, why not get everybody's teeth done and then go in and do a chiropractic adjustment? Like I'm all for this, especially when we are, I know for me, it was the chiropractor, the massage therapist, PEMF, barrier, yeah. dental, you know, and once a month and, you know, my God, yes. trying to keep my own schedule. And then theirs was a whole it, of course yeah. their own schedule. They have their own, their own set of appointments and, Luckily, I I own an Equivibe machine. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but maybe I'll I'll upgrade to a PEMF. But I have an Equivibe, so I was like, I can even do you know a little rehab in there as a fair, just a whole bunch of different things. I'm I'm wild, so I I could have a little business of three. Who knows? Of course you would, Morgan. Please, <laughs> please. I have no <laughs> doubts. No <laughs> doubts. Oh my gosh. Wow. So we've kind of touched on this about your career growth. You graduated in 2023. You've already built an impressive career. I'm impressed. I am so impressed. Thank you. And so now we've are, we've heard what your long-term goals are for the equine industry and, and how you see your roles evolving in the equine industry. Oh, my goodness. Um, so we're going to close on this, my friend. Well, we had to pause the video recording for a few seconds and start over again. And this would be a great place to say thank you to our sponsor, Shagbark Lumber and Farm Supply in East Haddam, Connecticut. So now a word from our wonderful sponsor, Shagbark. At Shagbark Lumber and Feed, they've got everything your horse needs to thrive from high quality grain and fresh hay to soft shavings and premium supplements, they've got you covered. Whether you're stocking up on grooming supplies or searching for the perfect feed, Shagbark is your one-stop shop for all things equine. Trust them to keep your horses happy and healthy, just like I do for my Dakota. Visit Shagbark Lumber and Feed today and experience the difference for yourself. Morgan, now that we're coming to the end of this interview, and I'm just, I could speak to you. You're another one for hours. <laughs> I know you don't have hours, but boy, <laughs> if I did and you did, what advice would you give to a young rider or a young equine enthusiast that's looking to pursue a career in, in the equine industry and specifically anyone interested in a career with off the track thoroughbreds, what advice would you give them? I would say just have patience. I think patience and a little, you know, humbleness because horses will humble you very quickly. 
um, and just do as much learning and as much research as you can. It is, it is a lifelong commitment and hobby and whatever, whatever discipline you're in, there's so much to be learned and never think that you know it all because sometimes I'm like, Oh, been there, done that. And little do I know there is so much more that you've not even touched the surface of. So I think particularly with off the track thoroughbreds, you know, have some patience, let them realize that they, they're not a racehorse anymore and that there is life after racing because there 100% is even with injuries. I've seen, I've seen all of them as horrific as they may be. And they can come back from a lot of them. If you give them the time, the love, the care, and just reach out, do networking. There's so much networking to be had. I mean, we're here on this conversation today um, there's so much network to be had and be open, be open to anything and everything. That was how I got to where I am today. I was a sponge. I sucked it all up. I did not come from a horse family. I said, I'm going to college for this. And I hope you guys know that because that's what I'm doing. And I took the leap and I was able to network my way to where I am, to where I'm comfortable and still growing to this day and still plan to keep growing. So just literally be open to anything and everything. And even if it doesn't work out, then you can at least say, I tried it. I'm not a fan and I know where not to go next time. And there's, it's just a whole learning path. Just keep open. I love it. And I love that even experiencing failure, whatever that may be, is not a a slam door, but rather an opportunity for learning. Absolutely. Thank you for that, because there are people out there, and in my experience as an equine gestalt practitioner, um, a lot of what I come up against with uh, coaching is people that are afraid to start because they're afraid of failure. And that's just part of the experience. Absolutely. And it, that's with anything. But with horses, you honestly, you might have more failures than you would even care to admit to. But that is how you learn. That's how you grow. And like I said, then huh, we won't do that again. Even in training, you know, I have a little, little oops there. I didn't like how that horse turned out. Not, not as a whole, but like that little, you know, little training. And I'm like, how can I revise that? How can I find a way to convey that better to the horse so that they can better understand what I'm trying to say to them? Absolutely. It's just, it just boops you over here and shows you the right direction. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Well, Morgan, we are coming up on the closing of this amazing interview. And I speak on behalf of our viewers. Thank you for your knowledge, experience, and wisdom. Um, We look forward to a part two, part three, as you progress in all your different many manifestations of new equine careers. (laughs) My goodness, I can't <laughs> wait to see where you are at 30 and 40. Gosh. That's about it because I'm older. I'll probably be dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for anyone that would like to reach out to you with further questions, can they email you or yeah. how? Email's great. I, I mean, I have a phone number, but I prefer email because then I can see your name and everything. But... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So can we provide your email address in the description box for people that want to ask some questions specifically to your industry and your experience? Yes, ma'am. All right. Wonderful. Morgan, thank you so very much. And I look forward to following you on your career path with thank horses. You. Thank you for all that you do. It was an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. You as well.